Okay, welcome everybody. So uh, you've seen you've seen the the plan of this course. So let me start with motivation. Uh, in uh, in the last decade or so, there was um, interesting progress in applications of conformal field theories in three and four and other dimensions of interest, uh, thanks to some activity which is called conformal bootstrap. And most of this activity has happened in the Euclidean space. But actually, uh, recently, more and more of this conformal bootstrap uh, studies, it also involves Minkowski space or Lorentzian space. And, uh, well, for me, uh, this has always raised a couple of puzzles. Uh, the first puzzle is that uh, it's kind of amazing uh, that this Minkowski space is so useful for problems which a priori have nothing to do with Minkowski space. Because much of the conformal field theories that we study, uh, they involve, uh, they originate from phase transitions, <coughs> uh, typically statistical physics phase transitions, so they can be studied with methods of statistical field theory, they happen in the Euclidean space, everything is at equilibrium, there is no time, there is no speed of light anywhere. And uh, it's not at all clear why should statistical physicists care about Lorentzian signature. And nevertheless, the experience shows that, uh, that they should very much care because there are many uh, constraints about Euclidean conformal field theory, uh, which are very hard to see in the Euclidean signature, but they become uh, they become transparent if you go to this Lorentz, if you analytically continue, if you study these constraints in the Lorentzian signature. And so I'll just mention a few of these applications of Lorentzian. so that maybe you'll connect to some buzzwords. So there is something which is called conformal collider physics. <laughs> then uh, there is a lot of work involving light cone uh, analytic bootstrap. So you'll find references in, in the lecture notes. Then there are very interesting constraints from causality. And uh, something which is called average null energy condition, ANEC. And finally, uh, there's a, a dramatic development happened last couple of years or so, which is goes under the name of Lorentzian OP inversion formula. So if you take all these tools and if you apply them, uh, if you assume that they are valid uh, because they involve Lorentzian space, and if you apply them, then you discover some very interesting things about Euclidean CFTs. And this, to, to me, uh, has always been puzzling. Why is this Lorentzian space so useful? So why useful? So this is the first question. And then there is a second question. Uh, why permitted? Why is this permitted? Uh, because, uh, so as I said, suppose you are you're, you're interested in some sort of phase transition and it's uh, coming from some Euclidean lattice. Uh, so when you're in the Euclidean lattice, uh, conformal field theory appears in the infrared. So in the Euclidean, if you, if you think in terms of RG, so we have lattice uh, in the UV and then uh, under some RG flow you reach CFT at long distances in the infrared. And so short distances on the lattice, uh, they are a very dirty business. They are contaminated with some non-universal lattice artifacts. 
uh, they don't really have to do with QFT, they have to do more with the lattice, so we don't really think about uh, UV on, on the lattice, definitely. Uh, and so when we do bootstrap in the Euclidean, we never ask uh, what do conformal field theory correlation functions do at coincident points. We only consider correlation functions at non-coincident points. And this makes very much sense uh, from the lattice perspective, from the RG perspective, because on the lattice you don't know, you don't have access to these coincident points anyway. Uh, but so this is in Euclidean, but if you go to Lorentzian, then you discover that uh, much of what happens in Lorentzian is precisely about what uh, correlation functions do at coincident points. Because in the Lorentzian signature, uh, <coughs> uh, correlation functions of quantum field theory, they uh, have to be, uh, as we say, distributions. So, and it means that if you integrate them against some test functions which are sufficiently smooth, then you can do these integrals all the way through coincident points and these integrals uh, should make sense. So, uh, so then th this is for me has always been puzzling. So how is it possible that you start from Euclidean theory which knows nothing about coincident points then you, you go to Lorentzian theory, and in Lorentzian theory you recover magically this uh, property of correlation functions being distributions including coincident points. And actually for all of these applications that I mentioned here, it is indeed important to know that your correlation functions uh, make sense at coincident points as well. <coughs> so, uh, so in this course, uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about this question, actually only about this question. So uh, I, uh, the question of why is this permitted. So I will, <coughs> I will explain um, why it is possible uh, to take Euclidean conformal field theory and uh, nevertheless uh, you can do a notification to Minkowski and you will see that indeed you get correlators which are well behaved in even at the coincident points. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about uh, about this question, uh, about applications and so on, actually. Um, but I'm going to give some references to lecture notes that you can where you can find this information. And so all of this is going to be based on uh, on some uh, ongoing and, and upcoming joint work with. Uh, with mm, Peter Kravchuk. Uh, who is a, a postdoc at the Institute at Princeton. And uh, and Jashin Chao, who is my PhD student, <coughs> who's here in the audience. Which should appear soon. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's the motivation. Uh, are there any questions or remarks? So, okay. so uh, then uh, the next uh, the next step will be uh, to explain what we mean by Euclidean conformal field theory and what we mean by the so-called bootstrap axioms. And this will probably <coughs> take most of today's lecture. So this material is, uh, so if you know something about the bootstrap, if you heard some talks, probably it's going to be quite familiar. Uh, <coughs> if you haven't, then uh, we will be all on the same page. And uh, at the end of this lecture, so I will first review like standard Euclidean safety stuff. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the lecture, I will talk about uh, applications of or why, why we believe this uh, axiom. So I'm going to kind of propose new axioms, which are not so new for some of you. Uh, and uh, in the end, I will talk about uh, why this, we believe that these axioms are true. Uh, so there are some theoretical arguments, and uh, there are also some 
is some evidence, hard evidence from uh, comparison to uh, numerical conformal bootstrap computations and the experiment I mentioned. So, uh, so let us start in, uh, mm, yeah, and in the subsequent lectures we will see how these Euclidean CFT axioms, they connect to Lorentzian axioms that uh, people have been discussing since the 60s and 70s, like Whiteman axioms and so on. So in conformal field theory in Euclidean, uh, the main objects of study are correlation functions of local operators. So we consider things like OX1, OXN. And these are points in the dimensional Euclidean space. So we consider the group of conformal transformations <coughs> on RD. Or actually, more appropriately, you should think of this group as acting on RD plus a point at infinity. So our conformal computation. And so uh, conformal transformations, these are transformations of our Euclidean space, uh, which have the property that if you take the Jacobian of the <coughs> transformation, G mu, Uh, then you should uh, this Jacobian it should locally uh, it should at every point it should be a product of some scale factor some omega of x times <coughs> some rotation matrix so so R uh, should be orthogonal matrix so as we say Conformal transformation looks locally as a composition of dilatation uh, and rotation. And uh, so, as is well known, in if you are in, in D larger than two, then uh, this group of conformal transformations is generated by uh, by translations, by rotations, by dilatations. Rigid dilatations, x like x going to lambda x, and there are these uh, beasts, additional beasts, which are called special conformal transformations. And these special conformal transformations, they are defined, so they they depend on a, on a parameter a, which is a vector in R D, and they are defined as a composition of inversion with translation with inversion, so this is translation. And inversion is a, is a special transformation. This just acts by x mu going to x mu over x squared. And uh, so uh, inversion itself is also a conformal transformation. But it's not in the connected component of the conformal group. It's not connected continuously to the identity. So when we talk about uh, conformal field theories, and if you would like uh, to be fully general, then we require them to be invariant under the, uh, not under the full conformal group, but under uh, the component of the conformal group continuously connected to the identity. And so that's why uh, we prefer to talk about inversion and uh, in various other special conformal transformations. Then there are going to be some special conformal field theories which will also be invariant under the inversion. But not all of them will have this property. So, um, so okay, how should you think about these special conformal transformations? You can think of them uh, on the, in terms of this, uh, on the Riemann sphere, so on, uh, on, the, on RD, with the point at infinity, there is an interesting uh, way to think about them. So, so on this uh, space, we have the infinity and we have the origin, zero. So then uh, we have translation transformations. And on the sphere, you can think of <coughs> translation transformations as some transformations which move uh, the origin but they leave the infinity fixed. 
On the other hand, uh, spatial, uh, spatial conformal transformations, they do the opposite thing. They fix the origin, but they move the infinity to some other point. So these are, these are translations, and this is special conformal. So there's this relation between these two classes of transformations. So actually, if you look at the notes, you will see that there are some exercises for students to familiarize yourself with these things. So sometimes one also introduces an algebra of conformal transformations, which is, uh, uh, but uh, I will introduce it if I need it. I'm not sure if I need it. <coughs> so now uh, the next step is that I have to explain what it means that the relation functions of conformal field theory are invariant under conformal <coughs> transformations. So this, this is, uh, uh, so I have to define the action of my conformal group on the fields. And so I have I have this section, so O of X is mapped into pi F O of X, where F is any conformal transformation. And so if I so I'm going to find this action, and once I found this action, once I specify this action, invariance just means that uh, correlation functions of O's of x1 dot 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 is equal to the same correlation function once I apply this action. So that's as just as simple as that. So you can say that in, in the language of, uh, of group theory, you can think of this as a representation of, uh, of conformal group. And then, okay, we have a bunch of representations, and then the correlation function, it, it is invariant under the action of the representation, so you can think of the correlation function as, as an invariant tensor of the conformal group. Uh, and the difference from the usual uh, compact groups is that uh, their invariant tensors are labeled by indices, but here our representations are labeled by uh, space-time points, by spatial points. But okay, in, in the end, there is this equation that we will have to deal with. And so we have to specify this representation. And so how we'll, uh, we'll refine it. You, so first of all, uh, as all of these representations work, we have to, uh, you can guess that pf of O of x <coughs> is going to be proportional. It's going to be something which involves O of f minus 1 x. So this is always like that. So if you want that our representations composed properly, we, we have to have this, this law, this kind of law. So given this relation, so I have to still specify the, the factors up front, we will see that uh, the invariance of the correlation functions is going to simply mean in this uh, pedestrian language is that the correlation function at one set of points is going to be related in some non-trivial way to correlation function at the other, at some other set of points related by its conformal transformation f. So uh, if, you, if you have this law, then uh, the transformations, they have a ch chance to compose properly because if you, if you apply them twice, pf times pg, then here you'll get f minus first times g minus first, and this you can write as f times t. This is the usual stuff. And uh, so now we have to fix the prefactor. And uh, um, so the prefactor now has to be fixed in such a way that these transformations compose properly, not just have a chance to compose, but really compose. And then uh, it turns out that the simplest case is that of the scalar field. And in, in the case of the scalar field, I'm going to write it like this. Uh, omega of x prime 
to the power minus delta O of x prime, where I just introduced the notation that x prime is equal f minus first x. So the law is very simple, where omega here is is related to f by this formula that, uh, <coughs> that I wrote there. It's the scale factor. So this is the transformation law of scalars. By scalars, I mean just fields which have no indices here. And uh, the meaning of this parameter delta can be understood if we consider a rigid transformation. So if we consider a rigid dilatation x going to lambda x, then this omega is just a number, lambda. And so uh, for rigid transformation, x going to lambda x, we have omega equals lambda. So now if we take this definition and if we plug it into this formula for the invariance, what we get is that uh, omega x one dot 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 Maybe let me write this formula for n different fields, omega 1, omega 2, not so, not so, O1, O2, and so on. <coughs> this is equal uh, to lambda to the minus delta 1 to the dot minus delta n, O1 of uh, x over lambda, x1 over lambda. So you have a formula like that, and by looking at this formula, <coughs> we, we, uh, we realize that delta, the parameter delta, is nothing but the scaling dimension of the field O. The delta is scaling dimension. And so in most physical applications, uh, this parameter delta is going to be a positive real number. And uh, there's going to be uh, an enumerable set of operators, perhaps infinite set, but enumerable set of operators. Each of them will have its own separate parameter delta, delta i. And they will also satisfy this uh, scale invariant problem, stack correlation function. So now, uh, I would uh, actually, in most of this course, I will talk about scalar operators, but let me generalize this uh, relation to fields with indices. So suppose now O has a, is a field with indices. Any questions? I haven't thought this out yet, but normally when we implement the symmetry in, in quantum theory, we implement it as like adjoint action with respect to some unitary operator on that observable. Um, but it almost looks like you're saying these are eigenvectors for that action or something like that. Uh, why is it why is it of this special form? Why is it of this special form? Mm. Well, you see, uh, um, I, I think your question uh, reflects your familiarity with the language of uh, quantum field theory in Lorentz and signature when we have a Hilbert space of states. On that Hilbert space, we have some unitary action. And then the operators that we talk about are actual operators acting on the Hilbert space. And then they uh, transform. Uh, of course, they can be transformed by this unit interaction. So here, I'm I'm not uh, in that framework. You see, I'm I'm setting up a different framework, which actually is quite standard in Euclidean conformal theory, where for the moment there is no Hilbert space. So I cannot act with my I cannot introduce some operators acting on some Hilbert space or anything. What I should I should just specify uh, the most general. Uh, transformation properties of correlation functions under the action of conformal group. So what those properties can be? Uh, they, the most general property will arise if I find the most general uh, representation of conformal group acting on fields. 
In fact, all those representations are classified. I'm just taking this out of the head. I'm saying that this is the only possible reasonable representation on physical grounds. Uh, that representation appeared also in mathematics literature in some classification with some important differences because uh, this representation from the mathematical uh, notation would not be a unitary representation if delta is real. So the unitary representation of delta is purely imaginary. <coughs> So there is this potential terminological com confusion, but as physicists, we know that scaling dimensions of, uh, of uh, operators appearing in, uh, as fix in fixed points organization group flows are typically real numbers. So we have to resolve this confusion uh, at some point. What I'm saying is that this rule that I'm just specifying is definitely mathematically consistent rule. Now I will have to connect that rule to what happens in the Minkowski signature. Any other questions? You mentioned uh, it could be complex um, Well, it would mean if scaling dimension were complex, so I haven't yet written down the formula for the two-point function of the operator, it would mean that the two-point function would not be just a simple power law, but a power law times uh, an oscillating function. And this, uh, I mean, this is very odd. This would be very <laughs> odd. That's why I'm saying that th this. I'm saying that in most physical application, this parameter delta has to be a real number. Although one can imagine some very specific uh, situations. Uh, from some perspective pathological, where it would be, uh, this number would have, uh, uh, would have an imaginary part. Then you would have to explain like what this means. You would have to combine perhaps operator with dimension delta with operator with dimension delta star. Such situations exist, but for this course, let's focus on the case when delta is real. So, uh, so I wanted to generalize this equation for operators with indices. It also has a, a very nice group theoretic generalization. So for, I, with, for operators with indices, I, I write it like this, pf of o of x. It's the same factor omega of x prime. But now, so the, what does it mean that the operator has indices? It means that it's going to be associated with some irreducible representation of the rotation group. So I have this matrix R, which is a, a rotation matrix at my disposal. So what I do here is that I take this representation rho in which the operator transforms. So this representation associates for every rotation matrix R some matrix which acts in the space of indices of my operator O. So I can multiply this rho of R uh, by O. I just have to think uh, at which point this matrix R has to be evaluated. And in fact, it has to be evaluated at the same point x prime as the scale factor. Then everything composes nicely. So this may sound a bit abstract, but what does this mean? Well, for example, if O has just one index, we will call it a vector operator, then uh, this matrix rho is just equal to the matrix R itself. It's just a, a very simple transformation rule. Why aren't we using all of F? Why aren't we just taking an irreducible representation of the conformal group, the conform like Normally, normally when we do this, we have an action of some group on our space, yeah. and then we also apply a group action on the space, like the internal space of, of for the operators. Like, why aren't we just taking the same f? Uh, you're asking why we're not taking the group action on itself? So this representation is irreducible. If I if I take uh, o transform in an irreducible representation of S O D, uh, which is which is this representation rho, then 
So what I'm basically saying is that take any reduce of representation of SOD, I take a parameter delta, I can cook up a representation of conformal group which is also reducible. And it's this given by this formula. There is some mathematics associated with it. It's an induced representation, but I'm not going into this detail. So to summarize, in, uh, in the conformal field theory, like in any concrete conformal field theory, we are going to have a list of operators or fields, or I. So in fact, in the Euclidean, you can use the word field or use the word operator. It's a bit by abuse of notation. So each of I is going to be characterized by its scaling dimension delta I and by some rho i, which is going to be an irrep of SOD. Uh, and uh, correlation functions of OIs are going to be invariant under this sort of transformations. So such fields are called primaries. And uh, the reason why they're called primaries is that uh, if you take a primary field and if you take its derivative, then actually uh, transformation rules for derivatives, they, have not, they do not have to be specified uh, in independently because they follow from transformation rules of primaries. And, uh, and you can check easily that uh, those transformation rules are not going to be the same transformation rules as, as those of primaries. So what's going to happen is that if you, so if you take derivatives, uh, so derivatives of arbitrary order, but let, let us take, for example, for, uh, for an ex as an example, let's take a field V mu, which is a derivative of a scalar primary. Then you can check that the transformation of this uh, operator, P of V mu, is going to involve in the right-hand side two terms. One of these terms is going to involve V mu itself because you just take this equation and you differentiate. And if the derivative falls on, uh, on this factor, then you get V mu itself. But the derivative can all, uh, if the derivative falls on O, then you get this factor. But the derivative can also fall on the prefactor, and so you will get some other term which is going to involve O itself. And so this transformation rule is not homogeneous in, in V mu. So, so we say that V mu, the derivative of a primary is not itself a primary. And in fact, it's called a descendant. See, there is a, a common misprint in CFT literature is to say descendant with E here, not A. But if you look at classics, which is uh, Bilal and Polyakov and Zemolochikov, they, they call it descendant with A, meaning that it's someone like it's your, it's your son or daughter is descend, someone who descends from you. But descendant is someone who descends up from you, like going up. It's not the same meaning. Uh, so, mm, so you can show under rather general assumptions that, uh, that any field in the conformal field theory is either a primary field or uh, a derivative of a primary field that is a descendant. So for most what we are going to do, uh, we can only focus on the primaries. So for example, when we talk about correlation functions of operators, we can clearly study only correlation functions of the primaries. But we cannot completely depend, forget about descendants. Because as we will see, when you take OPEs of two primary operators, then in the OPE, operator product expansion, you will find both primaries and descendants. So you have to remember about it. We will see it in a second. So another thing that I, I'd like to uh, mention as a caveat is that in this uh, short course, we will only talk about correlation functions of bosonic operators, which transform, uh, which transform in tensorial representations of SOD. In fact, one can 
one can and one has to for applications. There are interesting CFTs which also have uh, fermionic operators which transform in spinora representations. For example, fixed points of gross niveau model have such operators. Uh, but uh, then you will have to discuss usual subtleties, double cover, blah blah. But okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have time to do this. Okay. Now, following the time-honored sequence of how one reviews conformal field theories, now I have to talk about correlation functions and constraints on correlation functions. So um, this was first done by Polyakov in 1970. So he noticed two things, well, he several things. So the first thing to notice is that the, if you talk about two-point functions, then uh, an operator which transforms in the representation delta rho uh, can talk only to operators with the same delta and the same rho. So all other two-point functions are going to vanish, and this follows from conformal invariance. And so by, uh, by a change of basis, I, I will try to arrange that uh, the two-point function is, as we say, diagonal, which means that there for every, opera every operator O, or delta rho just has non-zero two-point function only with itself. So in general, it's going to be some complicated matrix involving all operators of the same dimension. But I would like, for simplicity, to focus on this diagonal case. And there are exceptional cases where this cannot be done. They're called logarithmic CFTs, but uh, I'm not going to discuss them. And so I'll give a few formulas. Uh, for example, O of x of 0 for scalars is some normalization divided by x to the 2 delta. Uh, then if you look at an operator with indices, for example, mu1, mu l, symmetric traceless operator, mu1, mu l of x, and then mu1, mu l of 0. Then there's a similar formula, so it's uh, here I multiply by some tensor. So this tensor T is what we call a tensor structure, and it has to be a conformally invariant tensor structure. And uh, in all situations of interest, there are very few of this. Uh, conformally invariant tensor structures, and that's what makes <coughs> conformal field theory so restrictive. And in this case of the two-point function, there's actually just one conformally invariant tensor structure, which uh, turns out to have this following form. Uh, so you take one tensor, mu1, mu1, x, mu l, mu l of x, and then, OK, if you just take this product, I'm going to write i here. i mu nu, it's delta mu nu minus twice x mu x nu divided by x squared. So if you just take the product, it's not symmetric traceless. It's symmetric, but not traceless. So you have to subtract the traces, which can be done in a unique way. And you get this unique tensor T2. So it's very nice. Is a unique two-point function. Now, if you go to three-point functions, things become more interesting. So if you take three operators, delta 1, rho 1, delta 2 rho 2, delta 3 rho 3, then in general, there is going to be a finite number of linearly independent conformally invariant tensor structures. But there are 
uh, there are two, there is one very important uh, for practical application case when there is just one uh, conformally invariant tensor structure and this case is scalar, scalar spin L. By spin L I mean symmetric traceless tensor with L indices. So in this case, there's a very nice formula. So in, in, in the case of three scalars, the formula takes this form. I apologize for those who have seen it already. Uh, it's probably one formula that every researcher in conformal field theory should remember by heart. Sometimes it's called Polyakov triangle formula. And so this Hijk is equal to delta i plus delta j minus delta k. So uh, notice that, OK, here in the two-point function, I had a, a normalization coefficient n. And convention sets this normalization coefficient to 1. Once I rescale my field so that n is equal to 1, this coefficient c 1 to 3 in the three-point function, it becomes meaningful. And actually, it's a, so this three-point function coefficient is observable quantity. It's interesting to ask what it is. And, and xij is the difference of xi with xj? Yeah, thank you. xij is the difference of xi minus xj. So, so this is the formula for three scalars. The formula for scalar, scalar spin L is, uh, has exactly the same uh, dependence on the differences, uh, but now you have, to multi you have to also introduce some tensor structure which will depend on the indices of the operator O3. And so it turns out that this tensor structure for scalar, scalar spin L, uh, for spin L, uh, we have to multiply by this tensor T3, which looks like V mu 1, V mu L minus traces. And this tensor, this tensor V can be written in a pretty compact way as 1 over x12, x13, x23 times x13 mu x3 squared minus x23 mu x13 squared. So, uh, so you see there are some interesting formulas that, uh, that one can write down and you can ask, okay, uh, how do you derive these formulas? Uh, so there is some technology for deriving these formulas which uh, allows you to do it in an almost brainless way, which, is, which goes under the name embedding formalism. So if you haven't seen it, the main idea is that uh, the conformal group actually is isomorphic to SO uh, d plus 1 comma 1. And so you can realize everything as living on some uh, auxiliary uh, cone in d plus 2 dimensions. And when you do computations on this cone, then a conformal group is, uh, is no more difficult than the Lorentz group. But then you have to project everything down to d dimensions. And when you do this projection, then these interesting tensor structures emerge. So, and since uh, for this Lorentz group, you can write only finitely many invariant Lorentz tensors if you have so many indices at your disposal, this explains why there are only finitely many tensor structures in D dimensions, conformally invariant ones. But okay, there is this formalism, you can read about it, but I, I'm not going to need it so much, so I'm not going to talk about it. Any questions? So uh, more interesting things start happening when you go to the four-point function level. Because at this point, 
you discover that uh, pure kinematics doesn't solve the problem anymore. Uh, so at the four-point function level, you can construct uh, conformally invariant cross ratios, u and v. Uh, so u is equal x12 squared uh, x34 squared over x13 squared x24 squared. And v is equal u with interchange of 1 and 3. And so, for example, if you write a four-point function of, of four scalars, let me take them identical for the simplicity. <coughs> so if you write something like x12 to the 2 delta, x34 to the 2 delta by some arbitrary function of u and v, any function of this form is going to be invariant under conformal transformations. So, so kinematics doesn't, doesn't fix the four-point function uniquely. Uh, and at this point, you, you have to ask, OK, I, I studied two-point functions, and I discovered I introduced these parameters delta, which are visible in, uh, in the two-point function. I studied three-point functions. I introduced these parameters c1 to 3, which are visible in the three-point function. Now I go to the four-point function. I discover even uh, more freedom. I discover the whole functional freedom. So what's going to happen? Should I now introduce more parameters in the conformal theory? And the answer is no. Uh, what you introduced at the two-point function and three-point function is enough to compute four-point functions and is enough to compute all other correlation functions. So this, uh, this is what I, uh, this is what makes conformal field theory so powerful, that, uh, that it is characterized by just two sets of numbers, by deltas and by the CIJ case. And so the, the technique which allows you to compute this, uh, this GUV is called operator product extension. So uh, there are various wa ways to write this OPE. So first I will just explain, I, I will, I will uh, uh, describe OPE, and then I will try to explain why we believe it is valid. There are some ways to rationalize, but let me first describe it. Uh, so OPE is written in, in schematic form as O1, O2 equals sum, uh, or maybe OI times OJ equals sum CIJK, OK. Uh, where I, this is schematic because I'm just here listing in the right-hand side all operators which appear in the OPE. But in the full form, OPE is written like this. <coughs> o i of x, O j of y <coughs> is equal. Let me write for two indices, one, two. Is equal to the sum over k, this coefficients c1 to k. Then there are some differential operators, p, which depend on the difference x minus y and on dy acting on OK of y. So, so there are these differential operators which are actually of infinite order in delta in dy. So they're going to be power series expansions in dy. And um, the way this equation is applied is that you can take any correlation function which involves these two operators O1 of x or 2 of y and some other stuff. And provided that these two operators O1 of x and 2 or 2 of y are sufficiently close to each other, this I'll specify what this really means. They don't have to be infinitesimally close to each other. It can be finite distance from each other, but they have to be closer to each other than to any other operator in this sum, in this correlation function in some sense. Then you can take this correlation function, you can replace uh, the product of these two operators by 
the right hand side of the OP. Now you get, uh, so suppose that this was an endpoint function. We will just take this differential operator outside. We get a sum of n minus one point functions acted upon by these differential operators. It's an infinite sum because there are infinitely many operators in general. But the claim is that this infinite sum converges. It converges, it's not just an asymptotic expansion, but it's a convergent expansion uh, even when these two operators, O1 of x and O2 of y, are finite distance from each other. So this is a, this may look like a, a very strong assumption especially if you're familiar with uh, the usual approaches, perturbative approaches to quantum field theory, where you do perturbation theory, but then basically nothing converges. Uh, you have to resum, or maybe um, there are non-perturbative effects. Uh, so even if you do perturbation theory to all order, it's still there is something that you're missing. So it's really a mess. You can also do operator product expansion in, uh, in perturbative quantum field theories, but there it's also known that it can, uh, it's not infinitely powerful. It, uh, it cannot give you full information about, about your theory. But here, the claim is that uh, actually, if you know everything, if you know this parameter C exactly, and if you know the parameters delta exactly, don't try to expand it. Don't try to think of C and delta as a power series in anything. Suppose that somebody gave you the exact values of these parameters, then the series should just converge in a like usual mathematical sense absolutely no no resummation needed so this is amazing and in fact uh, first time you see it you don't want to believe it because you say like how is this possible is this just going to be a conformal field theory let's just take some arbitrary conformal field theory not exactly solved infinitely many fields there's going to be just some total mass of uh, fields, if you think about the spectrum of a typical conformal field theory, uh, then what is it going to look like? There's going to be a, a few operators of low dimension. These are phenomenologically the most interesting ones. But then as you go higher and higher up, the spectrum is going to become very dense because the number of operators in the conformal field theory, it grows exponentially. <coughs> So at high dimension, you will have an extremely dense spectrum, exponentially many operators. And so, you, so this sum is going to contain gazillions of terms, more and more terms as you go to high delta. So how, how can it converge? You may, you may be worried how can it convert. And uh, the answer why it's going to converge is that, yes, there are infinitely many operators, but you can argue that uh, if you have many, many operators, then actually the, the number of operators is going to be always compensated by the smallness of their OP coefficients. So you will have exponentially many operators, but for most of these operators, the OP coefficients are going to be exponentially small. And so that's why the series will have a chance to converge. Okay, this is not meant as a proof. This is just meant to make you uh, more comfortable about how things are going to work, but now uh, you can go and try to prove this, uh, and this this has been done, but I'm not going to talk about this. So, so just to reiterate, yeah. you can always compute these um, endpoint functions by using the symmetry of the conformal group, and just like just show that the only function that's invariant under these transformations has to be of this form. That's how all of the initial examples were you could think of them as being derived, correct? Yeah. And then what you're saying is that there, this is like a, let me put quotes, theorem, I don't know how rigorous it is, but there's a theorem that says you can also compute it this way via the OPE, and it saves you significantly more time to compute. Uh, no, no I, I, no, I actually said more than that. I said, if you want to compute these correlation functions, one, two, three, uh, two point functions, three point functions by OPE, it's going to be a bit uh, masochistic because they already are known, I mean, they're simple and uh, actually one way to fix this 
uh, differential operator P, which as I'm going to explain next, is to take this OP and apply it to three point functions. The two point functions are really nothing to it. But if you apply this OP and, and you demand that it's consistent with the three point function, it fixes for you this operator P. Mm -hmm. But now I'm saying more. I'm saying that once you know the operator P, you can go even higher up. You can, you can, go for, you can also go to four point functions, five point functions if you so wish. And the only data that you will encounter when you try to compute the two point function, the, the four point function, for example, is the same deltas that you already know. Well, you assume that you know them. The same C's that you already know and these differential operators that you have to somehow compute. This is how it's going to work. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not using I'm not I'm not using this property. I'm saying uh, you can p prove convergence completely abstractly without knowing anything about uh, the size of the peak coefficients. But then, so you once you proved convergence, you say, but wait a second, how how is this possible? I have exponentially many operators, but then I pr just proved convergence. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the peak coefficients have to be exponentially small. Then you go in, in the known examples and you check, and indeed you see that uh, that that the exponential is small. You can prove the bound. You can prove a bound of the type that uh, a p coefficient summed in a certain window of dimension. Like take all operators in a certain window of dimension from delta to delta plus one. You can prove some bound on uh, the sum of p coefficients. Um, I, I can write it down. I mean, it's, uh, it's just what I said. The bound is going to be. A, so there are two spectral densities here. There's one spectral density. Let me call, call it. Uh, well, I already used rho, but let me write rho one of uh, delta, which is just the sum of delta functions. Cool all operators that I have in my theory, this spectral density would enter into the partition function of the theory. And the partition function will converge because uh, there is an exponential factor in the partition function. And even though there are many operators, they are killed by the exponential factor. But the spectral density, which is relevant for the four-point function calculation, is not this one. It's a second spectral density which is the sum of the same delta functions weighted by their p coefficients, 1 to i squared, roughly speaking. So what I'm saying is that uh, you can prove bounds on the integrals of the spectral density in any finite window. And the, the bound will say that the integral of the spectral density in some finite window grows uh, not faster than the power law as, uh, as, you, as you shift this window higher and higher. Okay, so people have thought about it and everybody was tranquilized. Uh, but now let me, uh, so we are, maybe after this discussion which was a bit technical maybe it's a good moment to to make a break if people are maybe people want to get a coffee or something i definitely want to get a coffee uh, so let us reconvene what would be the good time uh, in 10 minutes yeah okay so as i said one way to fix this differential operators is to apply the op inside the three-point function. So we have, we take a three-point function, one of x, two of y, and then OK of, of z, which on the one hand we know because it's fixed by conformal uh, invariance up to a coefficient. On the other hand, if we apply the OP inside this three-point function, what, what shall we get? Uh, well, one nice thing that you will get is that all terms in the OP, except for the term precisely involving OK, drop out. 
because we assume that the two-point function of any other operator uh, except the no k with itself is going to vanish with the k. So you just get one term out of infinitely many terms. And this one term is acting on the two-point function, OK of y, OK of z. So uh, the three-point function is proportional to the same coefficient c1 to k, which cancels. So you get an equation which involves three-point function that you know, two-point function that you know, and you, have to and you have to extract this differential operator p. So this formula shows that p is going to depend only on uh, dimensions and representations of the, op of the involved operators. And it's not going to depend on uh, the CFT in question. Of course, the dimensions and representation will depend on the CFT, but p is not. And uh, so for concreteness, let us consider the, um, let us just consider a general structure. So if I, if I take, um, so I would like to write it like this. I would, uh, so I would, I would like to rewrite this equation like this, O1 of y plus z, O2 of y, and OK of zero. And so this, uh, if I use Polyakov triangle formula, then this becomes one over uh, z delta one plus delta two minus delta k, y plus z uh, delta one plus delta k minus delta two, and then y delta k plus delta two minus delta one. And then I wish to take this equation and I would wish to expand it in the limit of small z. So then I get, what do I get? I get one over uh, z uh, delta one plus delta two minus delta k, one over y uh, twice delta k, and then I'll get a certain series, which is going to be one plus a series, like schematically, it's going to be a series in the ratio z over y. So it's going to be, uh, the corrections are going to be small if z is much smaller than y in absolute value. And so, so what does this mean? So in this expression, what do I recognize? I recognize that uh, this term one over y to the two delta k is this two-point function. So let me set, set here y to z to zero. Then this is this two-point function. And this guy is the first term in the differential operator. So what I basically say, what I basically understand from this formula is that p of z dy is going to be equal to one over z to the power delta one plus delta two minus delta k, <coughs> one plus, uh, there's going to be a series, there's going to be a series uh, in z times dy, roughly speaking. And this series has to be fixed in such a way that it reproduces this series. Every time I differentiate in dy, I get one uh, power and one over y. And so that's, that's how it's going to work. And actually, um, so this gives you a practical way to, to, to determine p. And uh, well, I give some references where you can see this computation be done, being done for the first few terms. Or there's <coughs> even a paper by Dolan and Osborne where it's done to all orders. <coughs> Uh, so this is one way to determine p. Uh, there are other ways to determine p uh, which are maybe a bit more conceptual because what uh, the main property of p is that it's a differential operator which is, uh, has to satisfy certain nice transformation properties under the conformal group. And so this property itself, if, uh, if it's satisfied, then it guarantees that if you take this p and you act 
on the two-point function, you'll get something which transforms properly under the uh, conformal group, so it has to be proportional to this three-point function. And this property is also sufficient to fix P. But uh, a third way to, uh, to compute P is actually even smarter. You can realize that uh, for most practical applications, you don't even need to know what P is. You just need to know that it exists. So because, because for, uh, one way, uh, the main use of P, as we will see in a second, is to uh, compute conformal blocks and to show that conformal blocks exist. But in fact, there are other ways to compute conformal blocks without ever talking about P. And so in the end, uh, this formula, which expresses P in terms of the series, it's almost never ever used in, in the conformal bootstrap. So let me introduce conformal blocks. I'll take a four-point function and let me consider for definiteness four identical scalars. Sorry, I forgot to say one thing. <coughs> uh, when is this series going to converge? So here on, uh, on the right-hand side, we know that this series is going to converge as long as z, absolute value of z, is smaller than absolute value of y. So why is this the case? Because, because I know that uh, the three-point function is going to have a singularity where this operator O1 approaches operator OK, approaches the origin. And this singularity is not visible in uh, any term in the series, so the series has to diverge at this point. And so uh, this is what I already said, that OPE uh, is going to converge, provided that the two operators that I'm doing the OPE. Uh, so now let me make this condition a bit more precise. They can be surrounded by a sphere, which does not include any other operators, except for the two operators that you are doing the OPE. So this is the condition for the convergence of the OPE. So now, uh, as we go to the four-point function, uh, it's very important to know this, uh, this condition because now we are going to use OPE several times and it's important to know, <coughs> in the end, we are going to impose some condition that different ways of doing the OPE should agree with each other. But for this condition to be uh, non-vacuous, uh, it has to be imposed in some region of overlapping convergence. So it's important to make sure that this region exists, which you can, convince yourself using this criterion about the spheres. But let us just uh, use this conform block. So we take this four-point function. And then we, uh, so we write it as a, we apply the OP twice. So we write it as, uh, we apply the OP to this two-point function, to these two operators and these two operators. And so we get the expression of the form uh, sum of CK squared, P of X12 uh, D x2, p of x34, uh, dx4, acting on the two-point function ok of x2, ok of x4. <coughs> and so this, uh, this whole beast uh, I'm going to call the conformal block associated with the operator OK. So it's some function of the four points. And as we said, this function is going to depend only on the dimensions and the representations of the involved operators. It's not going to depend on the CFT. We will also use this notation, schematic notation, for the conformal block. Stupid question is uh, is the um, expectation value cyclic, like like the trace, for instance? Like if I permute cyclically 
you get the same uh, it's more than cyclic since we are in the Euclidean yeah. and since we are dealing with correlation functions of uh, bosonic operators as I said uh, th this is really just uh, we can pr the order doesn't matter at all it's like a statistical physics so in particular the order of these um, differential operators doesn't matter even though you have derivatives and x's and oh they commute never mind well, this operator x yeah, at yeah. x two and this one x at x four, so it uh, it, it it doesn't matter yeah. in this particular case. Um, yeah. So a very uh, so it's as I said, this differential operator. One way to characterize it is that it's uh, it transforms properly under conformal transformations, and this means that when you act with it on a two point function, whatever you get, it also transforms properly on the conformal transformations. What it basically means is that the conformal block, each conformal block, it has <coughs> exactly the same transformation properties under the conformal group as the full four-point function. So for each conformal block, we can write a formula that g ok depending on points xi is equal to some fixed function small g ok which depends on the cross ratios divided by x12 to the power 2 delta, x34 to the power 2 delta. Where this function, which is also sometimes called conformal block, uh, is conf completely fixed by conformal invariance. And so uh, given this formula, we see that we solved the problem of computing the four point function in the conformal field theory, knowing uh, the coefficients ck and the dimensions delta. So you just, you have to compute these conformal blocks, you have to sum this series, and, uh, and you get the four-point function. So, mm, you, might, you may wonder, okay, I this solves this problem in principle, but does it solve it in practice? And I will give some examples uh, as we go, which uh, uh, will give an idea where we are uh, in, in the process of solving this in practice. Uh, but as a first step, you can ask, okay, yeah, so I, I just explained to you that <coughs> there are these very interesting functions, conformal blocks, <coughs> which encode a lot of information about conformal field theory. Uh, what do we know about these functions? Like, for example, can we compute them uh, analytically or numerically? Or like, what is the state of the art? So there is a, there is a, uh, there's a huge literature. There's a huge industry, in fact. So these functions are uh, extremely well known. So in, uh, in uh, even dimensions, in particular in four dimensions, they are known in analytic form in terms of uh, hypergeometric functions, you can express them. Uh, in three dimensions, they are, uh, they are special functions which satisfy some uh, differential equations, partial differential equations. Actually, in any dimension, they satisfy partial differential equations, which, uh, as far as we know, cannot be solved in terms of known special functions, except in some uh, very specific cases or some specific kinematic configurations. So in, uh, in, for example, when we do conformal bootstrap in three dimensions, what we use is that this, uh, these conformal blocks, they can be expanded uh, in power series expansions and we have very uh, efficient techniques uh, to construct this power series expansion. So if you, if you, if you are an expert in 2D CFT, you know that in 2D CFT there are uh, the best method uh, to compute conformal blocks uh, in 2D CFT is known as the homologic of recursion relations, which converge extremely rapidly. And so these recursion relations have been generalized to d dimensional case. Uh, and it's these recursion relations that they give uh, the most efficient access to, to conformal blocks. So in practice, uh, uh, even though we don't have a, a closed form formula for these beasts, 
uh, it's um, it's very easy to compute them to arbitrary precision to plot them and so on like to play with them to analyze their limits yeah. Yeah. Um, does the uh, the sum of the conformal blocks converge for all values of the positions no not for all of the positions uh, so it, it as I said it converges uh, provided you can take uh, you can find a sphere which separates points x1 and x2 from the points x3 and x4. Yeah, but that now, when is this going to happen? But that's the convergence of the OP, but I'm asking about the convergence, convergence of the sum of the blocks. I mean, the blocks, you said we, we can compute more or less, maybe not analytically, but we can compute them for all positions. It's right? the same, it's the same, uh, it's going to be the same condition. because. Uh, let me be, let me be a bit more concrete. So let us just first let us first understand when where uh, is this condition going to be satisfied? When is it possible to find? Uh, if I just draw for you four points, okay, like for example, let me take four points like this. Uh, well, it's clear that I can take. So this is x one, x two. In this case, it's clear that I can find a sphere which separates. So when is it that I will not be able to find a sphere? which separates uh, this, uh, this point, uh, two points from other two points. Well, the only case uh, when this happens is uh, um, when four points lie on a circle. So you can convince yourself that that's uh, the only case uh, when this is going to be impossible. So if four points lie on a circle, precisely in a circle, uh, like, let me put it like this. So for example, let me take x1, uh, x3, well, one special case of a circle is a line. So let's suppose that these points x1, x2, x3, x4, they lie on a line in this order, in the, in the uh, in the, in the inverted order, first x1, x3, x2, x4. In this position, it's not possible to find a sphere which separates x1, x2 from x3, x4. <coughs> and in this position, the sum of conformal blocks is going to diverge. In fact, uh, you can also see that the, con the conformal blocks themselves are going to be uh, divergent in this configuration. Uh, so in, uh, in all other kinematical configurations, the sum of conformal blocks is going to converge. And the rate of convergence is going to depend on how far you are from this uh, special kinematic configurations in a way that can be characterized precisely. So, so where are we? Um, I already said most things. So we have this expansion. Uh, we have one last axiom which says that uh, different, if I do different expansions in different orders, then uh, they should agree in the overlapping region of convergence. So there's going to be the most important bootstrap axiom. Well, all axioms are important, but this one is. is the one that makes everything possible is that there is this formula sum of k ck squared this just to the equal sum of k ck squared this provided that you can check that both expansions converge. And th there are many, many points. So for most of the points, both of these expansions are going to converge. So it's definitely not a vacuous constraint. <coughs> uh, so this crossing constraint should be satisfied for any four-point function. So, uh, so I, I gave you a bunch of rules. And uh, it's impossible to fully justify these rules at the level of mathematical rigor at present. 
But as physicists, we can try to to rationalize these rules a little bit and <coughs> uh, to uh, to get a bit more comfortable with them and try to understand why uh, they have a chance to be true, like as a glimpse of some beautiful future mathematical theory that will one day be developed. <coughs> and so uh, the best way that I uh, myself used to rationalize these rules and to connect it to the quantum field theory as we learn in, uh, in graduate school is using uh, this picture which you can call cutting and gluing picture. So uh, in graduate school we learn that quantum field theory is defined by a path integral and this path integral uh, uh, if you use the language of path integrals, then the main thing that it buys you, one of the things that it buys you, is that you can take the path integral, which is over all fields in, uh, in space, and you can pick some surface, some closed surface in space, which separates it into two parts, inside and outside. And you can cut the path integral along the surface. So what does it mean to cut the path integral on the surface? So we have a path integral <coughs> over all fields. So I emphasize this is meant just to make us comfortable with the rules. So for uh, before, until this point, uh, there was no action. There was no Lagrangian. There were just some fields and their correlation functions. Now for uh, 15 minutes, some actions and Lagrangians will appear, and then they will disappear for the rest of this, uh, for the rest of those lectures. So let us just imagine that behind our CFT there is some Lagrangian, uh, there's some action, and see what would, what would this mean. So we take uh, we take this uh, theory defined by this path integral, and then we can define we can divide this path integral path integration. In three steps, we can first integrate over uh, fields which live inside the surface. We can integrate over fields which live outside the surface. And then we can integrate over fields which, in the last step, over the fields which live on the surface. So when we integrate inside the surface, so of course when we integrate inside the surface, then we impose some boundary condition that phi on the surface is equal to some boundary condition, phi 0. And then we integrate over phi inside. So the result of this integration is going to be some function which <coughs> depends on the fields on the surface. You can call it wave functional. So let me call it, let me denote it as psi inside, which depends on uh, phi 0. We can define a similar psi outside. And then finally, when we do the uh, the full path integral, then the full path integral is going to be can be written as integral over the fields living on the surface of the product of psi inside of phi zero, psi outside of phi zero. <coughs> so. Uh, so this intuitive picture, it suggests that perhaps it should, uh, it's not just intuitive, perhaps in any uh, quantum field theory we can think uh, of, uh, of such path integrals, which by the way, so here I consider path integral without any insertions, but of course I can add some insertions, I can add some, uh, some correlation, I can consider correlation functions, I, I insert some fields inside, then maybe I insert some fields outside. Then this path integral is a correlation function. So what this picture suggests is that perhaps in any quantum field theory, I can think uh, of a correlation function as a product uh, of two vectors, which live in a vector space of states associated with the surface. And the surface is basically arbitrary. Okay, I can discuss if it has to be smooth or anything. 
so, uh, so this seems to be very general. Uh, now let us try to apply it to a CFT. So the first thing that you realize is that in a CFT, it's actually natural to use uh, surfaces, uh, not arbitrary surfaces. Uh, but it's nice to use surfaces which are spheres. So why spheres? Because spheres, if you take a sphere, you apply a conformal transformation, it's still a sphere. If you apply dilatation, then of course it just uh, dilatates. So this is a natural set of surfaces. And uh, what... Uh, what this discussion suggests is that I can view uh, the space of CFT states. I can introduce a space of CFT states uh, living on a sphere. And then uh, these CFT states, they're going to be created by operators inserted inside the sphere. And then this state of CFT states, space of CFT states, it has a natural inner product which is just given, so if I compute correlation function of, um, then this gives, so the inner product, so I have a state, I have a, a space of safety states. On the sphere. And uh, inner product is correlation function. <clears throat> now, uh, to make progress, we have to, to realize that um, so far, what I just said, it gives us an inner product between uh, states living inside the sphere and the states living outside the sphere. So it's not an inner product, strictly speaking. It's a vector product between two different vector spaces. But uh, to make progress, we would like to say that the state, that the space of CFT states is actually a Hilbert space. So, so it's, it's a vector product. But we need, we need Hilbert space And so it means that we have we need to have a positive inner product. So what does this mean? It means that I take a state which is just obtained by inserting operators inside the sphere, and I would like to know how to compute the norm of this state by itself. I don't so far I only told you that to compute I can compute the the, the vector product of this state with the vector product of some other state which lives outside. But I don't want to talk about other state. I just want to compute the norm of this state. <coughs> I have to have some uh, way to do this. So, uh, so we need, what it means is that we need to have some map which takes the state inside state and, take and maps it to an outside state. And we want to uh, require that, uh, uh, that uh, this map gives us a positive <coughs> inner product. Now, is this going to be true uh, for any conformal field theory? No. Uh, but uh, there is a special class of conformal field theories where this is going to work. And these are uh, so-called unitary conformal field theories. So this can be arranged for unitary conformal field theories. Now, now we are in Euclidean, so unitarity uh, is in Euclidean is what is called reflection positivity.
<coughs> I'm going to talk a, li a lot about reflection positivity in subsequent lectures. So if you uh, if you don't know what it is, then uh, I think you should uh, you should wait a bit. But uh, one very important property of reflection positivity, which makes it very useful, is that it can be checked in the UV. So suppose you are interested in some conformal field theory. For example, the one which describes the phase transition in the easing model. And you want to know if this conformal field theory is going to be unitary. So how do you know this? It's like, well, you can look at the lattice definition of the easing model. And you can show on the lattice that uh, the easing model has reflection positivity. It's actually very easy to show. Uh, and then this this lattice calculation guarantees that uh, that the CFT to which the easing model flows is also going to be unitary. Okay, this is a lot of uh, blah blah. It's going to become a bit more clear in subsequent lectures. But why am I saying all this? Is that uh, is that if we if we have a Hilbert space of states living on a sphere. Uh, and if uh, if the theory is unitary, so that this Hilbert space has a positive uh, uh, inner product, then we can rationalize uh, the bootstrap axioms in a very nice way, and we can prove OP convergence. <coughs> so why is that? Well, because in a, uh, so suppose now we have a Hilbert space of states living on the sphere. So we have a Hilbert space. What we are going to do is that we are going to choose in this Hilbert space a basis. So uh, uh, an orthonormal basis. So the what what is going and and then we are going to use uh, an additional uh, property is that uh, the dilatation operator acts on this Hilbert space. So we are going to diagonalize this dilatation operator. So we are going to choose in this Hilbert space, uh, choose an orthonormal basis. Of uh, eigenstates of dilatation operator. Uh, so if we can do this, then uh, it's very easy to understand why OPE has to converge. Because OPE expresses any correlation function. So any correlation function is uh, any correlator is expressed as, a, as an inner product of two states, psi1 and psi2. Operator product expansion becomes just uh, an expansion of each of these vectors, psi1 and psi2, in the eigenstates of the dilatation operator. So I'm taking that there is this state psi1. For example, I, it, it may be created by inserting two operators inside the sphere. It's just some particular state in my Hilbert space. <coughs> in the Hilbert space, I can take I can take a state of a finite norm. So this state has a finite norm. So I can expand it in, in the basis of, uh, that I chose, in the, in the orthonormal basis of eigenstates of D. And uh, <laughs> it's uh, the zeroth property of, uh, of Hilbert spaces is that if I take an inner product of two vectors, and I expand one vector in one basis and another vector in the basis, and then uh, the series that I will get is a convergent series. So uh, you see, if, I, if, if I'm uh, assuming that my basis is complete, then I'm basically done. Now, uh, this is not a claim for a proof. This is just uh, an invitation to reflect on this mental picture, uh, which I think, like, if if one day 
100% rigorous proof is going to be constructed, it should be constructed along these lines. I'm sorry, I'm having a lot of trouble understanding what the space of these states is. Are, are we viewing the like expectation values like a state on the algebra of our observables and we're taking like the GNS construction or I, I don't know where this uh, is. If you know about the GNS construction, this is kind of the physics uh, version of the GNS construction. <coughs> How is it, what's our state that we're using? Is it the vacuum state? Um, no, it's not a vacuum. Uh, you know, it would be a vacuum state if I did not insert any operators uh, inside the sphere. So we get a different space depending on... We get a different vector. In so for state? every for every, uh, for every every insertion of operators, we get a vector in my space of states. And what is that space of states? It's defined by this formula. You see, what does it mean that I have a... Uh, okay, how, uh, how do you add them or uh, yeah, mm, uh, si since you know the GNS construction, I'll, I'll, it's going to probably the answer is going to work only for you. So uh, take this correlation function and multiply it by some function of two points, x1 and x2. So I'm going to say that with every function of two points, I'm going to associate a vector in my, uh, in, in my vector space. Just my vector space is going to be parameterized by all possible combinations of functions of two of one point, two points, three points, and so on. So now uh, I, I specified this uh, vector consisting of uh, functions. Now I have to tell me what I have to tell you what is the norm of that vector is. I'm going to say that the norm of that vector is going to be com computed by taking correlation function of my conformal field theory and multiplied by this. Fs, and this is going to be the norm. So you see, this is the GNS construction. And now I'm going to complete, uh, blah, blah, and then I'm get, going to get the Hilbert space. So uh, mathematicians think about this way, and we think about this uh, just by saying that, okay, think about some fields which live on this. I specified the fields living on the, on the sphere. Every time I, so these fields have a certain distribution. If I don't insert anything, I get one distribution for fields living on the sphere. Which is what you wrote right there. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, which is with psi inside. If I inserted some stuff here. Then you put it I, inside the path integral. I will put inside the path integral, do the path integral. I'll get a different distribution of fields right. on the boundary. Right. So, yeah. But when this you take the inner product of those two things, um, you just, how do you do that, like, in terms of the path integral? <coughs> Because like you have one state, one state, or you just you ignore that and you just you just use the operators um, and you take their expectation value. Well, I can compute the inner product either from CFT by taking expectation value or by doing this path integral, provided that it's well defined. Okay. So, um, okay, where are we? I I want to present you some evidence. So I gave you some rationalization, and there is a, actually some nice paper by Albert Schwartz who tries to put it on a nice, uh, beautiful, rigorous mathematical footing. Uh, but I want to give you some evidence. Like, okay, this is some theoretical blah, blah, but what is some computational evidence that these axioms actually work? And, okay, there is different... Uh, there is a lot of evidence. Suppose you are uh, a 2D uh, CFT person. So you take some two-dimensional CFT. Now, in two-dimensional CFT, you have a lot of extra uh, stuff going on. You have Virasoro. Uh, when people talk about conformal blocks in two-dimensional CFT, these are not the same blocks as I introduced because they uh, they are much larger. They involve the sum over all Virasoro descendants. Well, here I was just taking the sum over derivatives. Uh, but you can take this two-dimensional CFT and you can view it. You can just say, okay, for the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to forget about Virasoro. I'm just going to focus on, uh, on the finite dimensional 
on the global conformal transformations, SL2C, which would then be exactly the same as the d-dimensional story. Now, what's going to happen if you do this? Well, one thing which will happen is that even in minimal models, you have finitely many Verasoro primaries, but if you decompose on the SL2C, you'll get infinitely many primaries. <coughs> so now you're already getting more close to, to the d-dimensional picture. Uh, you take a conformal block, uh, Verasoro conformal block, you decompose it, it's going to be an infinite sum of, uh, of conformal blocks with respect to SL2C. So uh, you can now uh, ask, well, is this sum going to converge? Now you have infinitely many terms. You have many, many more terms in, uh, in your sums. For minimal models, you had a finite sum of conform blocks. Now you decompose, you have infinitely many terms. Does it converge? Now you can check that uh, it's totally fine. It converges even though you decompose it. it uh, there's no need to perform any resummation. It just converges in the usual sense. So, uh, so if you take CFTs in 2D and you decompose the spectral cell to C, then all known examples that we have, uh, which have a discrete spectrum, they uh, also satisfy uh, these axioms that I described. <coughs> now, there are some very weird CFTs in 2D which have a continuous spectrum uh, that uh, would require, like, Liouville model. Uh, they will not uh, satisfy verbatim our axioms because the spectrum is continuous, so you would have to think about it. But it's interesting that in, in, in 3D uh, and in 4D, to my knowledge, there are no interesting uh, phenomenologically relevant uh, CFTs which have a continuous spectrum. Seems to be, a, it's not a theorem, but experience shows that people have not come up with such things. Uh, so, um, okay, so this is my first example. The second example is that, okay, you can, you can get some uh, comfort if you think, if you analyze free theories. So if you take three massless scalar, uh, three massless theories, for example, scalar, uh, fermions, or or Maxwell, well, Maxwell is only going to work in 4D. Uh, then you, then these theories are conformally invariant, and you can check that they satisfy bootstrap axioms. Like you can take uh, a four-point function in any of these theories, not just of the operator phi itself, but also of more complicated operators, because the phi has really boring correlation functions. Uh, and you can uh, decompose those correlation functions in conformal blocks. And you see, you can try to see if uh, these expansions are reasonable, if they converge, and so on. You can try to compute the coefficients. And people perform many of such tests, because uh, I, I give some references where you know explicitly OPE coefficients and so on. Of course, these theories have a very boring uh, operator spectrum. It's just... Uh, because they are all Gaussian. Uh, but nevertheless, okay, they give you some comfort that, uh, <coughs> that the axioms work. <coughs> so uh, finally, uh, another interesting example that uh, I'd like to discuss in more detail is what happens if you apply these axioms uh, to some three-dimensional CFTs Uh, that we know uh, should exist, but which are not exactly solved. And uh, we know that there are many such CFTs, because we are, there, are, there are many, many randomization group flows in three dimensions that should flow in the infrared to conformal field theories. Like, like one famous randomization group flow is that you take a scalar, uh, if you take a scalar field in 3D and you perturb by phi to the fourth, If you're, if you're a particle physicist, in, in 4D, phi to the fourth uh, just flows to zero, and you don't get anything interesting. But in 3D, phi to the fourth is a relevant perturbation. So it flows to something which is strongly coupled in the infrared. 
Well, there's actually also phi squared perturbation. <coughs> and the claim is that if you, if you fine tune the coefficient of these two perturbations in the UV, then in the infrared, you're going to flow to a CFT. There's a phase transition uh, in three dimensions. And this CFT is, is, a, is a very famous and very important CFT because it's the same one as uh, describing the phase transition in the three dimensional easing model. You can generalize it also to phi squared squared. So there are, uh, there are these CFTs. You can come up with gazillions of theories which flow to CFT in, in, in three dimensions. So, so they should satisfy, they hopefully should satisfy our bootstrap axioms. And uh, what, uh, what can we say about this? So I'll, uh, I'll discuss, I'll discuss uh, the easing example. So when we take phi squared, phi to the fourth. So what do we know about this CFT? Let us fine tune the parameters so that we flow to a CFT. What do we know about this CFT like on general grounds? Like a traditional approach is to do the epsilon expansion. You can, you can start at four minus epsilon, <coughs> then you try to do perturbation theory, you go uh, to epsilon equal one. Um, you can also do some RG directly in 3D, but uh, I'll not talk about this. So, uh, so this method, okay, it has been uh, pushed for many, many years, and it, it gave us a lot of uh, information about uh, what we expect about scaling dimensions in this theory, and also good uh, numerical uh, predictions for these dimensions, the RG. So what do we know uh, based on these techniques? And by the way, which agree very well with experiments, so we trust them. Uh, so we know that uh, there is uh, when we take the field phi, uh, we flow to the infrared is going to give us some operator in the CFT. Uh, we take the field phi squared, we flow in the infrared uh, is going to give us another operator in the CFT. So this one is Z2, uh, Z2 odd, this is Z2 even. <coughs> and uh, these two operators, they are relevant in the UV and they remain relevant also in the infrared. So they get some anomalous dimensions, but they remain relevant. But other operators, if you look, for example, at operator phi to the fourth, then this operator, it was relevant in the UV, but in the infrared, it should become irrelevant. Because, uh, you know, it's like when you, when you have a beta function it flows to a fixed point, phi to the fourth was driving the flow, it should become irrelevant in the, in the UV, in the infrared. So in the CFT, this operator should be irrelevant. So its dimension has to be larger than three. We are in three dimensions. Uh, okay, well, this is an interesting feature. Another interesting feature concerns the operator phi cube. So this operator was in the UV. In free theory, it was an operator, an independent operator, and it was relevant. But when you flow to the infrared, this operator uh, becomes, is no longer an independent operator of your theory. Because in, what happens is that when you turn on these interactions, <coughs> we have an equation of motion, and by the equation of motion, phi cube is box of phi in the infrared. So this is the perturbative statement. So uh, what this means is that uh, when we do the bootstrap, we only talk about primaries as independent operators, and phi cube is not going to be an independent operator in, uh, in the infrared. It's going to be a descendant of phi. So this is interesting. Why is this interesting? Because phi cube, if it were an independent operator, it would, be, it would have a relatively low scaling dimension. Because phi, I rem recall, in phi has dimension 1 half in, in 3D. So phi cube would be 3 halves. Uh, so you could worry about phenomenological uh, implications of such a low dimension operator. But actually, since it's a total derivative, it has no phenomenological implication. So it does not do anything interesting for RG. So this is, in the infrared, it's a descendant. <coughs> interesting. Then, OK, you look at phi to the fifth operator. Phi to the fifth operator actually gets uh, a very high, so this operator is a primary in the infrared, but it gets a very large anomalous dimension, so it becomes irrelevant, also irrelevant. So the conclusion of this discussion 
uh, which you see uh, it's a very qualitative discussion. Uh, we just need to know that some dimensions are large, others are small, and so on, and, and this equation of motion, is that in the infrared, we only have two relevant operators, uh, phi and phi squared, actually, we call them sigma and epsilon. And everything else has to be irrelevant. So this is a, a, an interesting prediction of randomization group and experiment. So can we uh, verify this prediction using the bootstrap axioms? Uh, is it consistent with the bootstrap axioms? So uh, the OPEs that we have to look at, they should then have the following schematic form. So sigma times sigma is equal to the unit operator plus some OPE coefficient that we don't know, sigma sigma epsilon times epsilon plus uh, irrelevant stuff. Uh, sigma times epsilon has to be equal the same OPE coefficient times sigma plus irrelevant stuff. And epsilon times epsilon has to be equal to this OPE coefficient times epsilon, OK, also the unit operator, plus irrelevant stuff. Um, so this irrelevant stuff includes irrelevant scalars. <coughs> But it, it can also include operators, uh, it should include also operators with spin. Because, because in this conformal field theory, in three dimensions, there are infinitely many operators with spin. And most important operator that uh, this conformal field theory should have <coughs> is the stress tensor, the menu, which has dimension three. We, we should also see it, this operator appearing in the OP, as well as infinitely many operators. So um, you can ask, OK, uh, this is the OPE structure that I expect. Uh, there are these constraints that some operators should be relevant. The stress tensor should appear. Uh, can I find a solution to crossing uh, which satisfies all of these constraints? So let me just, for example, look at, at all four point functions which involve these four operators, sigma epsilon, sigma epsilon, and epsilon, 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 epsilon. So if the axioms are correct, then there should be these four point functions which satisfy all the axioms, expansion and conform blocks. And they should, the leading terms in the OP should be consistent with this structure, which is just follows from <coughs> the, the two environments. And there are these two coefficients that I should be able to, uh, to find, the, the, the sigma, sigma, epsilon, and uh, epsilon, epsilon, epsilon. Notice that in 2D, this epsilon, epsilon, epsilon is zero for the two-dimensional easy model. But in 3D, there is no reason to expect that it should be zero. So uh, well, actually, it turns out that um, we don't know how to solve this problem analytically. But uh, you can try to approach this problem numerically. So you can try to see numerically if such solutions to crossing exist. And uh, of course, numerically, you cannot construct exact solutions to crossing. But you can, what, what you can do is that you construct extremely precise. Uh, you can impose some measure of precision. And you see that you can construct more and more precise uh, solutions to crossing, which satisfy all of these constraints that I mentioned. So this, this has been done numerically. And um, so what this suggests is that the assumptions that we make on our uh, conformal field theory, these bootstrap axioms, they are consistent. So there, there is no contradiction that has been encountered for this theory and for other theories that, uh, that have been examined. Uh, there was no contradiction encountered. So this uh, axiom seemed consistent. Uh, to me, this doesn't seem so surprising. What uh, seems to be more surprising is that not only these axioms are consistent, they are also extremely constraining. 
because uh, so as I said we can construct numerical solutions to crossing uh, but it turns out that uh, not only the solutions exist but they are also essentially unique and this is a surprise so what it means is that uh, there is a certain um, so if you parameterize the space of possibilities okay so which which parameters do we have here in this problem we we have the dimension of the operator sigma we have the dimension of the operator epsilon we have uh, these OP coefficients. Uh, we have all the dimensions of the, all the other operators that uh, there are infinitely many of them. So you have some allowed space in, in this infinite dimensional space of parameters, allowed region. So let me take this allowed region and let me project it. Let me take a two dimensional uh, projection of this region on the plane delta sigma delta epsilon. Then it has been found that uh, the space of allowed possibilities is extremely small in this, in this uh, where it's small as a whole, but also it has a very small projection is in this plane. Uh, so, uh, well, to, to, to give you an idea of how small it is, uh, perhaps it's just one point, but we don't know yet. Uh, to the extent that we have been able to impose the constraints of crossing, uh, this, uh, for example, the dimension of sigma is known uh, with uh, five or six digits. When you say projection, do you mean literally projection or intersection? Projection. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there are these results like that. So there is this island. There are pr predictions for delta epsilon with, uh, and all of these OP coefficients with comparable precision. <coughs> uh, so there is this island, which is called uh, 3D Ising Island, where the solution exists. And outside the island, the solution does not exist. But uh, moreover, if you, if you are inside this allowed island, then if you if you move around this island you see okay but how does my solution vary because there are infinitely many other operators in the solution well in fact since we don't have an exact solution we only see maybe like 100 operators or 200 operators what happens to these operators like do they jump around or well it turns out that these operators they also vary uh, very little so um, so the whole solution varies very little within this island like as a purely numerical empirical fact and so uh, it allows you to, uh, to extract some information about these other operators that, uh, that, that vary very little. So uh, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll just give one uh, piece of information that is interesting. So I said, for example, that phi to the fourth operator has to be relevant. Sorry, it's not. So phi to the fourth has to be relevant. That's the only input that I made. But now I can say more. Not only is it irrelevant, but I basically know what the dimension is because it varies very little. So the dimension of this operator, it's uh, just to give you an idea of, of precision, 3.82962. Well, there's some numerical stuff going on. Uh, so, uh, which is consistent, which is which is consistent with everything else that we know about the three-dimensional easing model from Monte Carlo simulations and from everything else. Uh, so, um, what is the advantage of uh, what is what what else can we learn uh, from all this knowledge? Well, for example, one thing that we can uh, do now is that since I said we already have 100 operators in the OPE with their, with their data, we can try to sum the OPE numerically. So I, I told you that the OPE has to converge, so let me just sum the OPE and let me uh, plot the four-point function. So what I'm saying is that uh, I basically can compute 
So I said that we can compute the four-point function sigma, 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 sigma at any point separation summing the OPE. Of course, it's a numerical computation. I only have 100 operators, but the OPE has to converge. So I can see, I mean, does it really converge or not? Uh, for example, uh, do, do the OPE coefficients of, of operators of high dimension decrease sufficiently rapidly so that it converges? You can do this exercise. It's very little. It's very easy uh, given uh, the available data. And you, you can plot this four-point function. You can stare at it. it uh, it's very nice. It satisfies various nice properties. Uh, but yeah, and the OP converges. So you, you, uh, you, this series indeed seems to converge to some finite four-point function, which satisfies crossing. So. Um, so to summarize, uh, given all of this, given all of this uh, evidence, uh, we are pretty confident that the bootstrap axioms they uh, they work, they are valid. Uh, so now it makes sense to uh, to pose uh, the following question. So suppose you have a conformal field theory in uh, in Euclidean, which satisfies the bootstrap axioms. And this is the only assumption that I make. Uh, can I take this conformal field theory and analytically continue it to, uh, to Minkowski space, or to, to the Lorentzian metric, uh, without making any other, any other extra assumptions? And to get a good theory in, uh, in Lorentzian metric. So uh, this question is uh, is interesting because, as I said, if you if you allow to do this, then you can then use Lorentzian space to make a lot of predictions about your Euclidean conformal field theory. Uh, so this uh, has never been done properly, uh, and so that's uh, something that I I would like to discuss in the next lectures. So I, I would like to discuss like what what it means first of all to have a good theory in. Uh, in Lorentzian signature, which uh, properties do we want it uh, to satisfy? And then uh, we will uh, see how to try to get these properties from the bootstrap axioms. So that's, uh, that's the plan. certain so uh, the symmetry has to be sufficient so the bootstrap it uh, it's it's magic but for the magic to work you have to have some symmetry okay. so for um, there are some particular quantum mechanical systems which have indeed extended symmetry and then you can hope to learn something about uh, that using the bootstrap philosophy. It's not going to be the, the same bootstrap that I was describing, but you can talk about bootstrap philosophy in general. And uh, one, uh, I think it would be most powerful for systems which involve many particles. And one system that uh, is on the, um, the to-do list is uh, uh, Fermions uh, at unitarity. So the Fermi's vision directed delta function potential, yeah. so that because in this limit, uh, this system, which is non-relativistic, it has an extended symmetry. It has some uh, version of non-relativistic conformal invariance. And in that case, uh, you can try to apply uh, conformal field theory and put some, okay, there, there's some work about this, but it has not been really pushed uh, to to the extreme, so there are no there are no dramatic results. That, uh, Beyond that, you could use for bosonic 
uh, I mean, non-relativist identical body, then we have these funny effects like every more. But this will require complex exponents. I don't know. Uh, well, uh, well, well, I don't know this particular system with the current mind, so I, but I'll be happy to talk about it. Okay. Was your initial motivation um, and your collaborators for thinking about this bootstrap was because you wanted to sort of somewhat formalize the idea of um, you know what happens in operators in particular? Did you have like an example in mind that you wanted to narrow down, like the icing model? What, what uh, it's hard to remember what <laughs> what motivation was ten years ago. Uh, Uh, you know, quantum field theory is such a hodgepodge of techniques, and uh, you know, as years go by, you look at the techniques that have been explored, and you think, okay, maybe this one has not been pushed as far as as it should, and let's see what we can do. And then we try them one after the other. The circle again. The number of ideas is finite. So, uh, do you know what contribution you made to or 200 operators in this easy model? What is their maximum conformal dimension? Or the 100. Uh, but if the number of operators grows exponentially, why is it, isn't it larger at conformal dimension or 100? It's a great question. So what happens is that... Uh, what happens is that uh, the operators in, uh, in the in the easing model so they have two parameters, spin and dimension. And because of uh, unitarity of the easing model, there is a bound. So the dimension has to be larger than L plus 1. So the dimension at spin L has to be larger than or equal to L plus 1 in 3D. So what happens is that uh, there is an interesting story here. So what happens is that there are operators which stay close to this bound. We call them low twist operators. And, uh, and then there are operators which, are, which live here in the bulk, like far away from large twist operators. So the operators which live close to this bound, there are not so many of them. It's like, OK, I'm partly empirical. Um, so what I'm saying is true partly empirically, but there is also some theoretical understanding. There are not so many of them, and they organize as some nice uh, trajectories, uh, the rigid trajectories. And their P coefficients are not uh, exponentially suppressed. They're actually only parallel suppressed. And that's OK, because there are not so many of them. So this does not ruin convergence of your P. And it, there are many things that people know how, uh, about the peak coefficients of this operator. Uh, so the operators whose uh, op peak coefficients are expensively suppressed are these operators which live in the bulk. And so what happens is that uh, you, can, you can see lots of operators of low twist because they have large peak coefficients and they are visible easily numerically. And you see that, the, that, that they should be there. You, you see that they are present. And then you see maybe a, uh, a bunch of operators here which are not organized in any energy trajectories and which have large twist. Uh, so when I say that we have 100 operators, uh, they uh, maybe like half of these operators they have low twist and they extend to extremely large dimensions, which is possible because their peak coefficients are only parallel suppressed. And maybe half of them have large twist, and they live in this corner. And they have much smaller dimensions. And then there is a lot of junk here, which we don't see because they have very small peak Okay. Uh, okay, let us thank 